conflict and stress. It seems like such an intensely individual, personal um, area. Whatever are we doing with it in the middle of this abstract stuff on organizations, their structure, and their environment? In fact, if you look at textbooks, you see that this topic can move around and fall into a lot of different areas, and sometimes is even split apart with conflict being put closer to decision making and stress either being individual or moving up into the area of organizational change. Or it's put together in the area of groups. So this, this is um, somewhat of a, a different topic has the appearance of not fitting, but my choice to place it with organizational topics is to frame it within the context of the organization. In other words, how are things that are happening in the organization and on the job encouraging, fomenting conflict uh, between individuals and between groups in the organization? stress as a reaction to conflict, and all of this as a springboard to change in the organization, which is where we're going to be going in the next couple of lecture sessions. So conflict as something that clearly relates to the organization, but something that we feel strongly as an individual. What is conflict? If we go to the first overhead. Think of conflict as a process that occurs when a person or group believes that others have or will take action that is at odds with their own goals and interests. I want to underscore a couple of words there. The first is believes because like everything else just about that we've discussed in organizational behavior, it's perceptual. It doesn't have to actually be the case, but as long as you think that's the case, then it's going to create in you feelings of conflict. And the notion is the other part of it is it's that there's something at odds with that it's going to frustrate your ability to fulfill some goal or to achieve something that if the other person or group carries through on their plans, it's going to interfere with your being able to achieve something. Looking at it from an organizational perspective, <coughs> we're going to first look at <coughs> organizational causes and how they relate to this feeling of conflict that we have. And then we're going to look at individual causes because it's a combination of two things going on. So what is it that can happen in organizations that lead us to feel conflict. Uh, most prominently, probably, is competition over scarce resources. This is a major factor when two individuals or two groups both want the same thing. We could say that this dates back to, in our own experience childhood, two children wanting the same toy, conflict. They both can't have it at the same time. And at an adult level, the toy changes, but the process remains the same. Two people, two groups, wanting the same thing. So a problem. Uh, we see this in organizations when so many people can be hired in the entire organization, a limited number, and every unit wants a maximum amount. Obviously, if some units get more, other units get less conflict over scarce resources. Um, or in an organization, space allocation. Just a limited amount of space. And both groups want to expand the space that they're using. Conflict over space. Translate this into a bigger picture. Conflict over space between countries. That's war. Uh, if carried far enough. So uh, conflict that goes on over scarce resources. A second factor is ambiguity over jurisdiction. Who has the right to do what? Who has the authority to do what in an organization? 
where it's ambiguous, where it's not clearly cut or spelled out which group has the authority, the responsibility for carrying out a task, and both groups believe that they have that responsibility, conflict. In fact, this actually happened in New York City where it was not clear whether the, the police department or the fire department had the authority in emergency situations. And there would be standoff, both groups ordering their people around and tripping over each other and getting in each other's ways. Not the best way to handle an emergency situation. Conflict. And so the mayor had to step in and say, who's in charge? Um, in universities, you sometimes get conflict over uh, who gets to teach what course because it's not clear where the course belongs. What's the jurisdiction on that course? Does it belong in an engineering department? Does it belong in a management department? Does it belong in a computer science department? Because courses that we teach today are broad-based and they're not clear-cut. They're not entirely management. We have things about, it, about information systems in it. Or they're not entirely management. We talk about re-engineering different processes. So these things are not clear-cut. And yet another area, and that is differences in power, in status, and in culture. Power. This conflict occurs when A needs B to accomplish something, but B does not need A to accomplish anything. Therefore, B has power over A. In A, it can cause hostility and resentment because A is dependent on B for getting things done. It may not particularly like the idea that they have to, this person has to wait in line or a group has to wait in line while B takes care of itself and doesn't do anything for A. Uh, so the more powerful can regulate the lives of the less powerful and sometimes do, do not take into consideration the needs of the less powerful. And what we're really talking about are the situations that bred the birth and the spread of union movements, where the power over jobs and job conditions belong to management. And yet people's needs within the organization weren't being met and were seen as being in conflict with whatever the needs of management were. And of course, there was a resolution to that in the union movement. Status. Again, differences in status can breed conflict, particularly when those of higher status have to rely on those of lower status. For example, the secretary who is facile with email has to show her boss the executive or his boss the executive how to use email. And the executive again may feel some conflict because this person of lower status has more expertise. Reliance on people of lower status again can set the stage for feelings of conflict and resentment. And culture. And now I'm not even talking about international culture, but you can get differences between culture within units of an organization. And the fact that they're operating on different values means that there's going to be some kind of conflict. The one that is most obvious when you look at any manufacturing type of organization or even service organization is the difference between production and sales. Production has its schedules in terms of when they believe they can get things out 
and get out a product or a service in a quality way. That's their main focus, that's their main goal. Sales has another goal in mind. Sales has in mind the goal of selling the product or service and may be ahead of engineering. In other words, promising things to people that production and engineering just aren't going to be prepared to deliver. But in order to line those customers up and make sure they don't go over to the competition, sales may begin to start promising those kinds of things. Then you get conflict between the two units. Because here you have sales with a bunch of customers lined up ready for the product, and it's not ready to roll. And now they have to keep them in line. Or there's pressure on engineering to get the product out, and it comes out less than high quality, problems in it, and again, conflict. And we're talking about really two different values and two different cultures operating in it. It also happens when there are mergers between two organizations, and the organizational cultures conflict with each other. They don't mesh well with each other. And for years, there can persist um, doing things the way Organization A does it, as opposed to Organization B. One of the mergers that never came off was a proposed merger between WordPerfect, when it was still its own organization out in Orem, Utah, and Lotus123, which was located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, the geographic difference alone should tell you something about the differences in cultures. Arm Utah had a culture in which they were extremely polite. Um, they were extremely concerned with organizational traditions and adhering to organizational formats. And Lotus123 was more of a loosey-goosey type of organization in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the proposed merger wondered, how are these two cultures ever going to fit together? Well, it never happened. And maybe one of the reasons it never happened is it was just going to be a tough merger to ever carry off. So conflict between cultures is yet another source. And finally, group identification. <coughs> There is an automatic tendency as members of groups to think that our group has some superior characteristics to other groups. This can cause problems. It causes problems because the understandable preference for one's own group leads to self-serving biases leads to seeing things a different way in terms of dealing with other groups. And so the self-serving interest may take over more rational interests that really should be serving at the time when you have to deal with another group, and ultimately leads to some kind of conflict between the groups. To the extent that any issue between two groups is framed as an <coughs> erosion of power, if I get into this project with you, I'm going to lose control of certain things. You're going to gain control, win-lose, and we'll talk about win-lose orientation subsequently. Then you can be sure it's going to be a situation that will be fraught with conflict. People don't like to cede authority. People don't like to cede responsibility. People don't like to cede power to other groups small example of this. It's just been in the news recently. In terms of the difficulty that has gone on in Iraq with the UN um, team that is searching in Iraq for um, unlawful weapons and uh, unlawful production of germ warfare and chemical warfare. A standoff, particularly between Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, and the United States, and of course Bill Clinton, 
figures as the head of the United States as its president. The solution, each side claiming that it won because nobody wants to lose. And I'm not sure any of us understand what the real story is. Conflict in all of it. So, organizational sources of conflict. But that's not all that leads to conflict because we have interpersonal causes. Conflict is ultimately something that we feel at a very personal level. Part of it is due to faulty attribution. We studied attribution when we started the semester, and we're back to attribution again. Yes. To the extent that we think that another person's behavior is purposely aimed at doing something hostile to us, or malicious to us, or hurtful to us, or is intended to slight us or demean us in any way, then we'll feel as if we were, are in conflict with that person. That may not be the cause at all. So we're attributing something to the person when we maybe should look at the situation as to why a person is acting that way. And then maybe the conflict would go away. Faulty attribution. Uh, trust also plays a large role in all of this because uh, we are likely to sign, assign malicious causes to people we don't trust to begin with, <coughs> even though that's not the case at all. Again, it could be a situational kind of thing, but historically we've come not to trust this person. The person has done something to us in the past which we believe is malicious. Now we have a new situation. We automatically jump to that malicious intent attribution as opposed to thoroughly trying to understand what's going on in the situation and we jump to a conflict stage when we probably really need not do that. But once you jump to conflict stage you may set conflict in motion that never really had to occur in the first place if we really understood what was going on in the situation. Along with that faulty communication, closely related uh, and so we get messages from people who, which are ambiguous, particularly from people we don't trust. And again, we interpret these messages in a negative way. They're ambiguous. We put the negative spin on the message. It had nothing to do with that person intending to be harmful to us, intending to cause us any kind of slight, any kind of embarrassment, any kind of insult, any kind of put down in any way. But that's how we interpreted the message. Um, even when we trust somebody dealing with negative messages, and I'm talking about not ambiguous, but now the message is negative, can make for problems. Because if the negative message is directed at us, for instance, if it's a um, performance appraisal interview and we're getting some negative information about us, Natural inclination, the tendency, I should really say the automatic tendency, is to get defensive, put the barriers up, not really listen to the information, assuming it's being conveyed in a way that is not hurtful, and then look for other causes, maybe attribute to the person, uh, again, some kind of malicious or hurtful intent. Uh, so faulty communication. Competitive reward systems can also do this to us. Uh, particularly where people are paid by commission uh, and you're competing with other people in your work group for territory, for sales, for getting customers, it's limited. Uh, again, you may come into conflict because you may not share all the information that you could be sharing with that person. It sets the stage where you don't want to share the information because if you share that information, they may be able to get some customers away from you or do better than you. And so if you have a competitive reward system, it can make people at an individual level act uh, in ways that are less cooperative and more competitive and set the stage for more conflict. And the last thing is personal characteristics. We can't get away from personality. 
some people are more competitive by nature and therefore get into more conflict. Some people are more mistrusting by nature and therefore get into more conflict. Some people are the sorts of people who just hold a grudge. Something happened, you thought the air was cleared in the past, but these people have long, long memories. And in fact, that had never been deleted from memory, they still remember. People who are high self-monitors, if you remember the term back when we talked about personality, the personality which tends to be sensitive to people out there and how people out there react are people who are usually more likely to act in cooperative, collaborative ways. They're less likely to get themselves into positions of conflict. And they're more likely to cooperate and even to compromise. So all of these things feed in. How to manage conflict. And I want to preface this by saying that when we think about conflict, we automatically have this negative image. Yelling, screaming, fist pounding, harsh words directed at each other. But conflict need not be all negative. And we're going to take a look at the costs and the benefits of conflict before we go into techniques for managing conflict. The negative side of things. Well, the negative feelings, the emotion, the stress, the anger, the agita, the anxiety, all of those intensely personal things, all of that's negative. That's a problem. It can lead to stereotyping, conflict. Okay, because once you're in conflict with somebody, you tend to not see the full aspect of that person and th tend to focus on just the negative types of things and begin to believe that people are acting those ways because of stereotypic images we may have, and negative stereotypic images we may have about the person uh, based on gender, race, ethnic classification, uh, could even be career, area that they come from, or whatever. So all of these can lead in. Um, faulty decision making a real problem with conflict and something that I want to underscore for you. Because when you're in a state of conflict, you have the concomitant negative feelings that go along with it. And that's particularly the point in time when you're not going to do the good kinds of information search that you should be doing to come up with a good decision. You're not going to be trusting of people who are not part of your immediate group and you're more likely then to engage in groupthink processes and not get different perspectives from the outside. So one of the real problems with conflict is trying to come up with good decisions as you're feeling all of those negative emotions. But it need not be all bad. There are benefits to conflict as well. One of the best benefits or the major benefits of conflict has to do with the airing and the discussion of problems that had previously been avoided, that had been swept under the carpet, kept under the table, had been suppressed. And one of the ways of handling conflict, of getting away from it, is avoidance, denial. It doesn't exist. We won't talk about this problem. The problem doesn't go away. The problem is still there. And so now, you can get the problem out on the table and begin, hopefully, to deal with it in a rational way and not begin to deal with it in terms of fantasy thinking. You know, if you deal with it at a fantasy level, you never expose it to the light of day. You may think the worst and the problem may not be or the conflict may not be nearly as bad as you imagine it to be. So real discussion of problems is perhaps the major benefit of conflict. It can then be the basis for change in an organization. Things aren't working right. We've got the problem out on the table. 
How do we begin to tackle it? How is the organization, the way it's structured, contributing to it? How can we begin to change things? So yet another benefit that can come from conflict. And it can serve as a basis for increasing motivation and loyalty. It's the notion, something like competition. That competitive edge, the edge that may come from conflict, begins to bring people together within an organization and begins to make them focus on the tasks that need to be done and get carried out in the organization. And in the process, they may feel a greater sense of loyalty. So all of these as possible costs and benefits to the organization. All right. Given all of that, how is conflict managed? Three major ways for managing conflict. Most typically, bargaining and negotiation. This is the process in which the parties in dispute make offers and counter offers. I'll pay you two million a year. No, I really want seven million a year. All right, I'll pay you three million a year. No, I could settle for six million a year. <laughs> and somewhere they will compromise, usually at the golden mean. Offers and counter offers. Mediation and arbitration brings in a third party. Parties aren't face to face, but you use the mediator or the arbitrator, and we'll go through the difference of those shortly. Uh, but some third party who's not directly involved in it and then can be somewhat cooler about all of it comes in to help settle it. Or finally, the setting of superordinate goals, goals that somehow are an umbrella over both sides and handle all of the various aspects that were desired on both sides and yet is bigger than where either side started out. Okay, bargaining and negotiations. First of all, something about the tactics that are typically <coughs> used in bargaining. Some of the specific things. Threats. I'll strike, I'll, like, I'll lock out in bargaining. Promises. If you come back to work, we won't um, dock you for time lost. Um, or future rewards, or verbal persuasion, somehow making promises to persuade the opponent, or gradual steps in concessions. You start with areas, and this is really quite typical these days in bargaining and negotiations. You start with areas where you can agree on certain things, and you use that as the basis for getting a positive orientation to the more difficult problems that are out there. This is the approach that has been used in the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians. They started out on easier areas, and they reached agreement on some of the easier areas. Now they're up to some more difficult areas hasn't worked quite the way they had hoped it would work. But at least some agreements have been reached, and everybody is still more or less willing to come to the bargaining table. It's, they're not always willing to come at the same time. That's one of the problems. But in organizations where there is threat of a strike, or where, in fact, a strike actually takes place, again, the usual procedure is let's start with the areas where we can find common ground fairly easily as a way of setting the climate for the rest of the settlement. And then sometimes you get into this area where you find you can trust each other, and it makes the settlement process easier. OK. Framing the issue. Important. And there are free, three ways of framing the various issue that are typically used. A task orientation. The task orientation looks at the jobs that need to be accomplished in terms of getting things done. An emotional orientation in which you look at the reactions that people have and are feeling about various certain things that are going on. And finally, a cooperative orientation. So you can frame the issue in terms of tasks, in terms of emotions, or in terms of cooperation. 
And clearly the two strategies or the two orientations as you start to frame issues that lead to better outcomes, faster outcomes, are task and cooperation. If you start to frame things in terms of emotional language, it gets much harder to reach agreement between parties. Then there's finally the orientation. Do you phrase things in terms of a win-lose strategy, what we sometimes call a zero-sum game? If I achieve what I want, you're obviously going to lose. Or if you achieve what you want, I'm going to lose in the issue. That makes it very hard to reach a settlement because of everything we talked about before in conflict. People don't want to cede power, authority, or whatever. People will wind up ceding some power and authority, but if the issues are framed that way, then you're going to cause people to lose face in situations, to feel demeaned, and they're not going to want to do that. So the need to frame things, and the way to frame them, if you can, is in terms of the win-win situation. That's where third-party mediators are often helpful, are able to come in and help set the stage for some type of settlement. Both sides stand to gain in terms of the win-win situation. Now, it's sometimes hard to get people into that kind of situation because people will often be willing to tolerate a loss if somebody else loses more rather than both sides winning. And they've looked at this in various types of games that people play uh, and found that uh, they get into this losing mentality and I don't mind losing as long as the other party loses more. As opposed to, yeah, we both could win something if we cooperate. Getting people to that cooperative stage is not easy. Um, aspects of mediation. Okay, mediation is a little bit different. We have um, this, okay, good. Aspects of mediation. Mediation and arbitration are slightly different from each other. In both, there is third-party intervention. And in mediation, the mediator makes suggestions as to how to settle it, but does not have the authority to impose a solution on both parties. Arbitration, it's different. In arbitration, again, there is a third party in there, but the arbitrator has the authority. Both sides give the authority to the arbitrator to impose a solution on the two groups. In this case, we really talk about binding arbitration, and in some cases, it's written into contracts. There is binding arbitration between the two groups. There is also something called final offer arbitration. For those of you who are involved in sports, you know that sometimes arbitration comes into play in baseball in terms of settling salary disputes. And that uses final offer arbitration. In a final offer arbitration, both sides come in with the respective number. And the uh, arbitrator gets to choose one side or the other. What's interesting about final offer arbitration is that since only one side is selected, the person cannot cut through the middle. It puts a kind of responsibility on each of the parties in the dispute not to present an offer that is too unreasonable, because if it's too unreasonable, it'll be rejected. So it sets a framework for trying to get people to act in more reasonable kinds of ways. OK, aspects of mediation. Enlarging the pie. In this tactic, both sides get what they want because new resources, somehow new money is found out there to handle it. So somehow the workers get their increases and management somehow has found new money to fund the increases. And they're not going to be put in uh, some kind of financial jeopardy by giving the increases. Log rolling. Log rolling means that each side makes concessions on low priority issues and um, 
then we'll gain something on the higher priority issues. Okay, log rolling as a tactic. Cost cutting, frequently used. I've heard of it being frequently used in municipal negotiations. And that is that one side gets its increases, gets what it wants, and the other side is able to manage this because somehow cost cutting is going to come into play. And you typically hear about this taking place when you hear about productivity improvements. Yes, there will be an increase for the workers, but there will also be productivity improvements which will take care of paying for all of the increases. So what are these productivity improvements that they typically are talking about? Well, it may mean that fewer workers take care of doing the job. Well, that would certainly increase productivity. That means that the union now is willing to have some workers let go because fewer people will do it. Or there may be some kind of technological improvement as a way of handling it. But something will allow for that to come into place. And finally, in bridging, neither party gets what it wants, but a new option is developed which satisfies both sides. Okay, so in arbitration, the third party has the power to impose the solution. Okay, and I mentioned before the last strategy, superordinate goals, where new goals are created that overarch both sides. For instance, in communities, busing frequently becomes an issue and is the basis for conflict. However, if you frame it in a different way and frame it in terms of quality education, and no one is against quality education, then you create superordinate goals and you create ways for appropriately integrating schools and providing quality education. Magnet schools were one of the attempts to do this. Creating superordinate goals. That's a difficult one. Um, but it's also a very fruitful one. Conflict. Conflict leads to stress, the negative side of things. Stress. What is this stress thing? Well, it's a pattern of behavioral, emotional, physiological reactions that occur in response to demanding events, stressors out there in the environment. And if we look at a model of stress, we see that we experience stress due to organizational causes and individual causes. Both contribute to what is going on. If we pause for just a minute and consider what's happening to all of us as we approach the end of the semester, if we come off that for a minute, we can probably delineate things that are organizational in terms of causing stress and things that are individual. Organizational. Everybody gives you the same due date. If you could somehow have some discretion as to when those things are due, right, would help if you didn't have everything due at the same time. It's organizational. But what about individual? Let me toss out a question. Is anybody willing to reflect through and think about what it is about your own study habits that might relate to anything that you're experiencing as stress right now? Anybody willing to be reflective and offer up something? Well, let me ask another question. Is there anybody here who has never procrastinated? You've never, ever put anything off. Oh, then I see everybody in the class has a quality that helps contribute to it, <laughs> OK? The individual quality of procrastination. Very interesting. Some recent studies that were done at college students, and you could say uh, almost, yeah, I could have told you that. Uh, and they were looking at the quality of procrastination in students. Okay, the procrastination gets you into trouble after you're a student as well, trust me. Um, what they found out is that students who procrastinated felt less stress at the be beginning of the <coughs> semester 
than students who were more diligent and conscientious in getting the work done. Students who are diligent and conscientious at the beginning of the semester already feel a moderate level of stress because they feel as if they're falling behind much earlier than students who are procrastinators. Comes the end of the semester, I will tell you that situation reverses remarkably because the students who are diligent and conscientious are now feeling as if they're more in control of things. And while they're feeling some stress, it nowhere near matches the level of stress as those people who said, oh, yeah, I'm a procrastinator big way. OK, so an individual quality that many of us have that feeds into feeling stress. The two factors, if we go back to the overhead, OK, merge and contribute to experience experienced, and I need to stress, no pun intended, experienced stress. Because much of this is perceptual. And so what one person may perceive as threatening and stressful, somebody else could perceive as challenging and not feel it. So this is quite personal thing. And all of these contribute to physical symptoms that we feel, physiological, psychological, and ultimately <coughs> relating in behavioral symptoms. OK, the, or or the organizational side of things. Demanding jobs. And some jobs are obviously much more demanding than other jobs. The awesome responsibility when somebody's life depends on you, that has to be stressful. And if you take any of the occupations in which people's lives depend on you, those people have to feel stress. People who work in any of the medical-related professions have to feel stressful. If I make a mistake, so what? I get a little embarrassed. I convey some erroneous information. The consequences are not catastrophic. But suppose I were a nurse, and I made a mistake, and I administered the wrong medication to somebody. That's a problem. And that's why jobs like that are so much more stressful. Or suppose you're working in an air traffic control tower. It's your responsibility to get those planes up and down and get them in, in the right positions. You let them get too close to each other, catastrophe, stressful. So positions in which people's lives are dependent on you have to be more stressful. Positions where there are frequent deadlines, and we're talking about deadlines that we know are episodic in the end of each semester and the stress level goes up. But what if you work for a newspaper and you are on deadline every day? That has to be more stressful, if you think about that sort of thing. OK? Um, and then people who have to work in horrendously dangerous conditions. A coal miner, um, firefighters, policemen. Uh, astronauts. Uh, the people, and I forget the terminology used for them, but the people who specialize in putting out fires in oil wells, yet something else that's dangerous. The, there is a job, and the job is called a jumper. I must tell you about this job. Okay. The job of the jumper is to go into nuclear power plants, okay, into the... Um, uh, the nuclear, the radioactive containers there and do repair work. These people don't work for any organization. I mean, nobody would want to give them the health benefits that's required. They're exposed to a certain amount of wrenches in the process of doing the job. They work as independent contractors. And they can get exposed to up to so many over a period of time, they work closely with the Atomic Energy Commission. Okay, <coughs> I think they're under um, their aegis. But imagine that job, getting exposed to all that radiation. And now there's some people who choose that kind of job. Most of us would never think of engaging in that kind of job. OK, so demanding jobs clearly do it. 
competing demands. What do you do first? Two demands on you. Uh, and here the competing demands can be demands within the organization competing demands or demands more typically we think of these days between family and work. They're only 24 hours in a day. You can't do anything about that. And yet you have an enormous number of tasks you have to accomplish, some of which you're probably being asked to accomplish at the same time. That's going to cause a feeling of stress in you. Role ambiguity. You're uncertain about what key elements of the job you should do first or what are the priorities that you should uh, pay attention to. Ambiguity in general is stressful. And it leaves you feeling as if you're out of control of the situation when things are ambiguous. You don't know exactly what's happening. Job responsibility. The more responsibility you have on a job, the more stressful it is. The more you know the buck stops at your desk for some important project, and that project isn't going well, and it looks like the company might lose money, and it's your neck on the chopping block, the more stressful the job is. Okay, responsibility. Isolation. I should tell you, misery loves company. The old adage. For people who work in isolated situations, again, it's stressful. All alone there. And you have no way of knowing what you're feeling is the appropriate feelings for this situation. Unpleasant working conditions. Also stressful. Talked before about uh, working in a coal mine. But if it's too hot, too cold, too dirty, too smelly, we can go on and on about all of these things. All of these add stress. Too noisy. You ever try working in a noisy environment, particularly when you're trying to concentrate? All of these add stress into the situation. And on the individual side, what have we got? Stressful life events. Loss in particular is stressful. Whether it's a real loss or an imaginary loss. Loss of a person, obviously, through death. Very stressful. Loss in terms of a relationship that breaks up. Very stressful. Financial loss. Very stressful. Okay, so all of these create to loss. But there are other changes in life that are difficult as well. Illness, <coughs> moving, getting married, getting divorced, having children having children go to college. Okay, all kinds of changes in life, and some of them are positive, still create stress in life. And to the extent that some of these tend to bunch up at one time in your life, even more stressful. So stressful life events. And then there's daily stress, the hassle of doing things over the course of a day. And if I ask you to think about things, you can probably start enumerating from the time you get up of things that didn't go right today that created levels of stress, the traffic that you endured coming here uh, as a possibility. Uh, disc failure, something that could create stress. Everything you had was on the disc, and you got in, and you popped it, and you were ready to use it, and all of a sudden, it didn't work. Computer failure, the people you depend on not coming through, stores that give you hassles about different things. All of these are the m things that we go through, and it's part of living but it's also stressful. And then, finally, personality and perception. All of these are things that lead to possibly increased stress. In terms of personality, some people are just hardier than other people. Some people seem to be more fragile, and they can't take any stress level. They seem to fall to pieces. Other people seem to know how to put things in perspective and can tolerate more difficulties in life. Some people are more patient than others. If you're more patient, you're going to be able to deal with stress a lot easier than if you are impatient. Because if you're impatient, you're going to get into a lot of situations in which you simply can't control what's going on, and you will still feel stressful. You want something to happen, and you want something to happen now. 
But shooting up your blood pressure and shooting up that level of stress isn't going to make that thing happen now. Okay, what am I talking about? You call up and you want to deal with some sales representative and you're put in the queue. I'm sorry, all of our customer representatives are busy right now, but your call is very important to us. Please stay on the line and it will be answered by the next available representative. Music. The message again. More music. The message again. And you feel your blood pressure going up. No matter how high your blood pressure goes up, that customer representative isn't going to come on the line any faster. Take a cup of tea, take the newspaper, sit down. Okay? It's not going to help anything. It's just not in our control. And yet, we do feel that increase in stress level. So that's one of the other things. That tendency to sometimes see a situation as threatening and sometimes to see it as an opportunity. Perception of the situation. What are the effects of these on the individual? There are clearly physiological symptoms related to stress. Productivity loss. This is somewhat hard to document, but clearly we can see how it can happen. Low levels of stress may be somewhat helpful. If you're too relaxed, you're never going to get out of bed in the morning. Okay, you need some level of stress to keep the system going. But it's when it starts to accelerate. And um, clearly, that can happen as well. Okay, let's go back. Let's take a look at physiological symptoms. Headaches. You've all been in that situation where you have so much to do and all of a sudden the throbbing headache sets in. And you walk around with your bottle of aspirin or ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, whatever it is you're taking. High blood pressure clearly results from all of this. And if you sustain stress for too long, you can begin to get cardiovascular types of diseases. You can also begin to experience from stress certain psychosomatic illnesses, illnesses that have their origin in conflict and stress, but are clearly physical in nature. Some people break out in rashes. Some people get asthmatic. All of these things can be stress-related. If things get too bad, we talk about burnout. Now let's move to some of the psychological symptoms for what are happening. Burnout. This is from prolonged exposure to stress. And it's marked by feelings of anxiety, feelings of depression, and along with that, feelings of helplessness. It particularly seems to happen from people who are in the helping professions, people who are social workers, and people who have to deal with people who are depressed and seem to be living in chaotic conditions, or people who are working with individuals who are experiencing terminal illnesses. And they get, ultimately, after a while, callous about what's happening. They seem to depersonalize other people. So that can be a real problem. Sometimes, with all of this, there are substance abuse problems. Substance abuse is not a good way to handle stress. People can't use substance abuse because it works so well but not a particularly good way. And finally, some behavioral symptoms. I talked before about productivity loss. People are distracted by stress. They can't focus on the job. They're thinking about self-involvement. How are they going to cope with something? And they get into, again, an ineffective way of handling stress called avoidance. If it gets so bad, it's avoidance. I'm not even get out of bed in the morning. I can't face this day. OK, but avoidance, you have absenteeism go up at work. You have increased tardiness. You have people just spending more time away from the job. Uh, and you may have more turnover. How to manage stress? Well, personal approaches, lifestyle. 
that healthy lifestyle. Better diet, better exercise is one way of coping with it. Some physiological approaches, relaxation techniques, biofeedback, just some techniques to help get you relaxed. And once you start to feel relaxed, that transfers to other situations. Some cognitive approaches, think it away. Reframe the situation, look at it differently. Um, the slogan that typically used is, don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. Reframe the problem and don't see it as the major problem that you think it is. And it helps you begin to get control of the situation. Some organizational approaches. Maybe you can redesign the job. Air traffic controllers have better uh, computerized monitoring there so that signals go off and there's something that's going to alert them to emergencies. Uh, maybe an assistant to be hired for a very busy administrator is a way of helping the person cope with the job. Social support, very important, particularly in stressful type of jobs. If you have other people who've been there and done that and can give you some perspective on things, that helps. A supportive social network helps in all instances. A little TLC can help you get through some stressful situations. Family-friendly policies in the workplace, particularly putting in child care centers and giving workers flex time to deal with that work-family conflict. And finally, wellness and EAP programs, employee assistance programs, counseling in the workplace to help people deal with things. And finally, giving them memberships in health clubs and screenings and things of that sort to help. So where have we been? We've looked at two sides of conflict, the harmful and the beneficial. We've explored organizational causes of stress and how to manage conflict um, and how to manage stress. Where are we going with all of this? Well, change and development. Using stress as a basis for knowing that the organization needs to change and get up to date with the times and handle various situations. Next time when we meet.